You are watching Grassroots Community Television, helping you make television people watch everywhere. Broadcasting on cable channel 82 in Glenwood Springs and Carbondale, and channel 12 in Aspen, Snowmass, Basalt, and El Jabal. Free over-the-air broadcasts throughout the Roaring Fork Valley. All programs can be watched anytime, anywhere at grassrootstv.org. The following program has been made possible in part through our partnership with U.S. Trust. From wealth structuring to investment management, U.S. Trust's global perspective, unique team approach, fiduciary platform, and more than 200 years of experience provide for the kind of insights, solutions, and expertise that have a worth all their own. Thank you all very much for being here. As you can see by the incredible overflow crowd, there is nobody in Aspen who less needs an introduction than Tom Friedman. Uh, somebody once said that uh, of Henry Kissinger, and he said, there may be nobody who less needs an introduction, but there is also nobody who more enjoys one. <laughs> so I will say a couple of nice words about Tom, unnecessary though they may be. Tom, for uh, ever since he went from Beirut to Jerusalem decades ago, has been the clearest thinker about where our country is going, where our world is going, and he speaks reported common sense. If you have been living in the age of the blogosphere, you know how rare reported common sense is. And that's why all of us think of Tom as one of the national treasures and certainly a great friend. And my question to you, Tom, is you're a foreign policy dude. What are you doing writing a book like uh, your next book on uh, um, American domestic policy? Well, Walter, thank you. First of all, it's great to be here with you. Um, uh, it's wonderful to be here at the Ideas Festival, and uh, it's just amazing what you built here. And so I'm really uh, honored to be here. And thank you all for coming out at this early hour. Uh, so uh, I have a book coming out in uh, September, September 5th, uh, written with, uh, as Walter said, with a, um, a friend of mine, Michael Mandelbaum. And Michael is a foreign policy professor at Johns Hopkins. And um, what are two foreign policy guys doing writing about America? It, the book really uh, came about by accident. Michael and I have been in conversations about foreign policy, as my wife will attest, probably every other day for the last 20 years. And um, uh, we noticed something, that over the last two years, we would start out talking about the world, and we would end up talking about America. And we eventually came to the conclusion that America, its you know, health, vitality, and vigor, and its fate, are actually the biggest foreign policy issue in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book we've written is called That Used to Be Us, How America Lost Its Way in the World It Invented and How We Find Our Way Back. And by the way, when does it come out? Just uh, it comes out September 5th. The title actually was given to us by Barack Obama. Um, uh, you may recall or you may not recall that the day after he lost the midterms, he gave a press conference in which he noted that China's building high-speed rail. Um, China now has the world's fastest supercomputer. That used to be us, said the president. And I heard that, snipped it out, and made hmm. it the title of the book. Uh, if you see something, say something. So the first chapter of the book is called If You See Something, Say Something. It's a riff off the homeland security motto. Only our point is that um, the biggest homeland security issue right now uh, is the health, vitality, and vigor of our country. Uh, the basic theme of the chapter is that um, uh, the American dream is now in play. Uh, the, the future prospects and possibility of the American dream is now in play. And I think what people don't really appreciate fully is how important the American dream is 
uh, not only for the stability of our own country, the notion that each generation will be able to do better than the previous generation uh, has been uh, such a bedrock engine for pulling and holding together uh, this incredible uh, mix of cultures, identities, and immigrants. And, um, but I think what people don't also fully appreciate is how important that American dream is for the stability of the world. Because the United States provides a huge amount of global governance. Uh, whether it's uh, patrolling the sea lanes um, in Asia, or it's um, uh, you know insisting on the right rules of uh, global economic treaties, um, we provide a huge amount of global governance. Uh, and I'm not ashamed to say I, I think that we are the tent pole that holds up the world. Uh, and if we go weak, if that tent pole buckles, uh, your kids won't just grow up in a different America. Uh, they'll grow up in a different world. But doesn't some of that come from just ignoring our history and not knowing where we come from? Well, um, no, it's a, it's a good question, Walter. And, and the way we sort of diagnose where we are right now um, is, uh, is, is with this sort of framework. You know, I believe that, um, you know, the book, I should say, begins um, just to get to that question. And what really sparked us to write the book, I was in Tianjin a year ago at the World Economic Forum. And I was at the um, uh, Shenzhen, China, which is about three hours drive uh, south of Beijing. And the conference was held in a convention center that, um, if it were in Washington, D.C., would be a tourist site. Uh, it was that new, spanking, and beautiful. And uh, my friend Orville Schell is here, and Orville and I uh, were at this conference together. And um, I came home from that uh, meeting, and I, I should say, excuse me, um, when you go to the website about the conference hall in Tianjin, uh, it says that uh, this conference hall construction began in um, September of 2009, uh, and it was completed um, in May of 2010. <laughs> and I was walking around my room saying September, October, November, December. Um, that's eight months. So uh, I got home, and um, I called Michael. I was just telling him about my trip. And his wife actually got on the phone and said, Tom, have you been to the Bethesda Metro lately? And um, we live in Bethesda, both of us, and we take the Metro a lot to work. And I had been there, and I knew what she meant. Um, and that was that they have been repairing the two escalators mm -hmm. in the Bethesda Metro <laughs> uh, for six months. Um, this is not a joke. They've been repairing them for six months. So I went down there, actually interviewed the people repairing it. And, um, uh, and there are exactly 21 steps in the Bethesda Metro. <laughs> and um, that contrast, uh, you know, is just uh, so overpowering. And then I started researching, actually, about the Bethesda Metro. Um, and uh, there's a great letter to the editor in the Washington Post. Someone described the sound of the escalators as a dying Tyrannosaurus Rex, mm -hmm. you know, what it sounds like. And, but one letter to the editor really struck me. Um, uh, it was someone complaining, because when these escalators are shut, what it is, they shut one, then they freeze the other, and it becomes a two-way two staircase. So it, it creates a huge human traffic jam to get off the metro. And this one letter to the editor ended, um, but we're sort of getting used to it. Wow. And I thought, yeah, that's the problem. Um, uh, we're sort of getting used to it. And that's the kind of decline I think we're in right now, Walter. We're in the worst kind of decline of all, a slow, gradual decline, where it never reaches a point of criticality where people just put down all their political nonsense and say, this is code red, we have to do something about it. And so we try to say in the opening chapter, this book actually isn't about China at all. The meta theme of the book is all the answers are actually in America. But the point we try to make is that China today is getting 90% out of what I consider to be a vastly inferior political system. The problem is we're now only getting 50% out of what I consider to be a vastly superior political system. So we argue that, that there are... Um, well, wait, stop right please. there on the uh, superior political yeah. system. There's a huge downside to China's ability right. to build things in nine months, which is that they're Absolutely. not a democratic... Our system is superior. Explain that. Well, um, if you think about the world we're going into, um, let me back up, make one point, and then try to sure. answer that, Well, because it's a profound, it's a profoundly important question. So I think we face four meta problems today as a country, four great challenges. The first is adopting to the IT revolution. Uh, the second is adopting to um, uh, globalization. And those actually merge. They're one challenge, basically. And they are, in my view, fundamentally 
a education challenge. Uh, the second uh, challenge we face is uh, what I call uh, all the energy, all, all, sorry, all the entitlement uh, debt and deficit issues. And the, the last um, is uh, energy and climate. I think those are the four great challenges that we face today. So um, what all those challenges have in common is that they uh, have reached a point of criticality where the only way to address them is with collective action. You cannot address those problems without a, if you're talking about a deficit and entitlement, it requires a Simpson-Bowles-like collective action where both parties get together. We cannot have an effective energy policy without collective action today. You cannot have an effective education policy without uh, collective action. And precisely what we have lost right now is the ability to act collectively. Right. So um, the, 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 I, I would say the, the broad framework, and, and here's how I can get to your question, I, I think that w where we are today is that we, we've made um, sort of two fundamental uh, errors. That first of all, we made the most dangerous mistake a country or species can make. We misread our environment. Mm -hmm. And we misread our environment at the end of the Cold War. We interpreted the end of the Cold War as a great victory, when in fact it was the onset of the biggest challenge, I would argue, our country has ever faced, competitive challenge. We just created two billion people just like us. Mm -hmm. uh, all with the aspiration to have the American dream, only with huge pent-up aspiration. Um, they're, they're, they're like a, a, a champagne bottle that's been shaken for 50 years and the cork just came off. So just when we thought we won, um, the end of history had come and we could put our feet up, we actually needed to be tying our shoes and, and redoubling our effort. Then we compounded that mistake in the second decade after the Cold War by deciding we were going to devote the whole decade basically to chasing the losers from globalization, mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda, rather than the winners. Mm -hmm. So that is, that's sort of the, the framework of what's been going on. Now, in answer to your question about sort of the American system, it gets to, I mean, to me, the, maybe the third you know, huge mistake we've made. Um, in the Air Force, uh, they teach fighter pilots something called the OODA loop, O-O-D-A, observe, orient, decide, act. And the motto in the Air Force is if your OODA loop is faster than the other guy's OODA loop, you're going to blow him out of the sky. And what I would argue is that in this sort of sense of complacency at the end of the Cold War, our OODA loop got really slow. Mm -hmm. And it really hit me, I mean, going to Singapore to work on the book, I interviewed a Singaporean economist who said, Tom, you know, we, um, uh, we, we in Singapore, we live in a thatched hut with no doors and no windows. Mm -hmm. We feel every change of temperature. We feel every change of breeze. You Americans are living in a brick house with central heating. You feel nothing. Mm -hmm. And why is that important? So you go to the debate we're having now, Walter, and it's the Republicans say, I, I cut you a trillion, um, and the Dems say, I, I know 90 billion, 900 billion. I see you 10 trillion, and I raise you 3 mm -hmm. billion. Um, that's the debate we're having right now. Without anybody standing back and saying, well, excuse me, what world are we living in? Right. Okay, what, what, what are the big trends in the world? And then therefore, where do we need to cut, invest, save, you know, and okay. inspire? Because y you can grow without a plan. We've proven that. If you cut without a plan, you can hit a big artery. Yeah. You, can, you can blow out a huge artery. And that's the scariest thing going on right now, Neville, is that we are having a debate about cutting without any plan of where we're going. And the point we try to make in the book is, I am not a green eye shade guy. I am not about April 15th. I'm about July 4th, mm -hmm. okay? This country, it, that July 4th is now at stake. I'm not after American solvency. I'm after preserving American greatness. Right. And that's not the discussion we're having. So we entered the debt and uh, deficit crisis, let's say, eight or nine months ago. The president appointed a commission that astonishingly was courageous and did what he asked them, the Alan Simpson or Symbols Commission mm -hmm. that you mentioned. And it gave a pretty good blueprint, which you could have built upon to say, now that we know what the cuts are, let's spend the next month or two right. saying how you do it right. Yeah. What kept our system from just embracing that and moving with it? Well, I would say two things um, are kind of standing in the way. Um, uh, and we have a chapter on both. One, I think we've had suffered a real values decline in this country uh, over uh, in the passing from the greatest generation to the baby boomer generation. 
Uh, we went from a generation that I believe lived by practice and believed in what I would, what, what my friend Dove Seidman um, yeah. really taught me, uh, and Dove is a big feature in this book, living by what uh, we would call sustainable values. Values that sustain. That whatever you do, you do it in a way that will sustain, okay? You don't, and, and, and contrast with that, and this is the new values that prevail in our country, situational values. You do whatever the situation allows. If the situation allows me to um, uh, give you a million dollar mortgage and um, uh, you're only making $15,000 a year, no problem, I, I just do it. Because we live by IBG or YBG. I'll be gone or you'll be gone, mm -hmm. okay? Um, uh, either way, but neither of us will be here holding the bag. So we've actually moved as a country, Walter, I think from, you know, uh, a, a generation that pa practiced sustainable values to one practicing situational values. That's the first move. The second is what's happened to our politics. And the, I was thinking about actually Michelle Bachman this morning, mm -hmm. okay, because I'm sorry, you I was, uh, because she's, a, a, I think, a paradigm of what's happened to our political system, which is you have a lot of political senators, congressmen who come here, and individually they're all like really rational people. But so you ask like, why do they behave so irrationally? Um, uh, when they're, when they're in, in, in together in one room. And the only answer is, I'm a big believer, life is about incentives. So people respond to incentives. So you, the only way you can really explain like wh why Obama, say, didn't take up Simpson Bowles or, 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 or why the Republicans are doing what they're doing is because the incentives are all wrong. I'm just a big believer. You know, move the cheese, move the mouse. Don't move the cheese, the mouse doesn't move, yeah. okay? So these people must be responding to cheese that we don't see. Right. So let's talk about... What is, that, what, what is that cheese? Well, there's a whole set of um, political changes that have overtaken the country that account for that. First has been the purging of liberal, northeastern liberals, Rockefeller Republicans from the Republican Party, and the purging of uh, southern conservatives from the Democratic Party. So both parties now are so much more homogeneous. Well, think about that. When there were Rockefeller Republicans in the Republican Party and southern conservatives in the Democratic Party, both parties spent a huge amount of time negotiating with themselves mm -hmm. before they negotiated with the other. We've completely lost all of that. So the parties are now much more homogeneous. That gets reinforced by gerrymandering, where now districts are purely Republican or purely Democratic. Um, then you have the whole uh, campaign finance laws and special interests that overlay on that, because the bigger the federal government gets, the more that is at stake with special interests. And finally, um, you have the media. Um, <coughs> and this is, and I'm going to tell a Michelle Bachman's story. So John Stewart made this point. I thought it was really a smart point. He said, you know, 24-hour cable was invented for O.J. Simpson. It was invented for the O.J. trial. Well, O.J. doesn't kill somebody every day, thank goodness, you know. And the problem is these people have to fill those 24 hours even when O.J. hasn't murdered somebody. And so what they do is they fill it with Michelle Bachman. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, I have a particular grievance with her because um, I was speaking at the University of Indiana. This is a real story, um, uh, six months ago. And um, uh, to their, uh, it, was, it was environmental talk to their honor society. Mm -hmm. And I go to, after the talk, I go back to my hotel room and um, just to massage my brain, I turn on the TV, CNN's on, and I, it's the top of the hour, and Anderson Cooper is doing a story where he's explaining he has to rebut and correct a story he had on the night before. What was the story? Congresswoman Michelle Bachman was on the night before and said that President Obama's trip to India was gonna cost $2 billion. I forgot what the two billion, one, whatever it was. <laughs> and, and he had let it go. Yeah. And he did a wonderful thing, Anderson Cooper. He deconstructed the whole story, mm -hmm. showed how it began with an unnamed Indian official in Maharajasthan, as if an unnamed Indian official in Maharajasthan would have any idea what the president's trip would cost, yeah. okay? And that it was gonna cost a billion dollars and involve 32 naval ships. I mean, this thing was crazy, okay? Yeah. So he deconstructed the whole story. In fact, I thought it was so good, I, I, I got the, the transcript and I wrote a column oh, yeah, on it, you know, saying, giving him a shout out for doing this. The next morning, I'm having breakfast with the Honor Society at Indiana University. I get my bagel, my coffee, I sit down at the table 7 a.m. The first thing a young man says at the table is, did you know Obama's trip was gonna cost a billion dollars? <laughs> and I said, 
didn't you see Anderson <laughs> Cooper? Did you, you see know, my column? Didn't you see, I mean, I hadn't written it yet. Oh. You know, didn't you see, um, and so here's, and, and so I actually tell this whole story in the book, and, and then at the end, and the last line is, and Michelle Bachman just announced for the presidency. Yeah. Okay, that is utterly irresponsible. Let me talk about the role of new media. Please. Because in that case, for example, you can argue that it was because of the internet or whatever that spread that story. But actually, even before Anderson Cooper, the, uh, there was self-correcting mechanisms right. on the internet yeah. that found out that that you right. know, helped uncover exactly. the story was wrong. Do you think the internet is increasing the polarization or may at some point give us enough information that we're better off? Well, it's a good question, Walter, and I feel about the internet the way I always felt about globalization. It's everything in its opposite. Yeah. Okay. So the internet took that story and spread it all over the world. And then Rush Limbaugh put in Drudge, and they all had a field day with it. If you actually deconstructed the story, what you found, and, and to their credit, um, and I'm, I don't remember the website, and some of you may know it, there is a website that within hours yeah. actually corrected, got to the bottom of the whole story. So the great thing about the internet is it spreads the lie, and it, it can, someone can ferret out the facts faster than ever, because all of us are smarter than one of us. The problem is the complete asymmetry between the people spreading the lie and the people uh, ferreting the facts out and getting them to people. So the lie you know, was around the world three times. The facts, were, the correct facts were there, but you would have to know where to go you know, to find it. So there, there is an, an, an asymmetry. But let me, let me pick up on that um, point, if I could, Walter. Go back to your question about kind of America, our system, China, et, et cetera, because it, get ba it gets back to the question of what world are we in? And um, uh, we actually have four chapters on this because they're related to IT globalization and therefore the education question, which is such a subtext of the discussion here. Um, and the first chapter is called Up in the Air. It's taken from the movie. I'm sure many of you saw the George Clooney movie because that movie, to me, that is when archaeologists dig up the first decade of the 21st century, that is the movie. Um, the guy whose job is firing people face to face loses his job to someone who wants to fire them over the internet, okay? And um, that is all about what has happened since you, know, you hosted me four or five years ago to talk about a book called The World is Flat. Mm -hmm. So I wrote The World is Flat in 2005, it came out. Um, and I, God, I thought it was on the cutting edge then. If you open that book up today and look in the index, Facebook is not in it. So when I wrote The World is Flat, Facebook didn't exist, Twitter was a sound, the cloud was in the sky, 4G was a parking place, <laughs> applications were what you sent to college, and Skype for most people was a typo. Yeah, right. Okay? <laughs> now, that is what has happened. That is what has happened since I wrote that book. I thought I was on the cutting edge, okay? So now I'll take you to the Arab Spring, because this is related. Um, basically, is that when I wrote The World is Flat, it was about that we had made Boston and Bangalore in India next door neighbors. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, Boston and Bangalore are now connected and next, next door neighbors, the world is flat. Mm -hmm. What's happened since is we've connected Boston, Bangalore, and Sirisi. Mm -hmm. Say, where's Sirisi? Sirisi is a village 90 miles from the interior with 90,000 people who now have these, okay, and are connected wirelessly. So in, to put it in the terms of the Arab Spring, we went from connecting Detroit and Damascus to con connecting Detroit, Damascus, and Dara. You say, where's Dara? Dara is the dusty Syrian border town where the revolt in well, Syria okay, began, yeah. um, where they've been feeding through flip cams and um, video cameras and just cell phone cameras. So much information out, despite the fact, you realize Al Jazeera, the BBC, CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS, Air, New York Times were all banned from Syria. Yet if you, every night, you can watch footage coming out of Dara, and it's all labeled, if you look at the bottom, it's labeled SNN. What is SNN? Stands for Sham News Network, okay? All right, the five people in the front row here have enough money in their wallet to start Sham News right. Network, okay? <laughs> and um, we have all been learning about this, so what's happened is we've, the world has gone from connected to hyper-connected, or, or my friend Dove has a good way of saying it. We've gone from connected to interconnected, mm -hmm. okay? And, and so we've gotten so much more grease. That's where the conversation actually has to start in America, because what it's done is, to put it in the lingo of labor economists, it's taken skills bias polarization 
and just blown it wide open. Now, wait, before we get to America, let me Please. just ask, to what extent do you think information technology was a driver, cause, or whatever of Arab Spring? I, I think it was a facilitator. And just as the, um, I, I believe probably the early telephone was a facilitator of the Mossadegh Revolution in Iran in 1952. Um, so, so but, but, but exa it, it, you know, whatever the technology is, there people use it, and so, and it's always a facilitator. But at the end of the day, think about Stereo Alter, and how different it was. I had the the great, really, ple I mean, pleasure is not the right word for it. The incredible opportunity to be in Tahrir Square when that revolution happened, and those people were brave, but it's nothing like the Syrian people. Right. The Egyptians knew their army wasn't going to shoot at them. The Syrians, every time they walk out the door they know the army is going to shoot at them and kill them. What's going and, to happen you know, in Syria? You were a Damascus correspondent for a yeah, while. Beirut, yeah, I mean, it's, um, well, I, I think that, um, I, I, I guess my, my general view is this. Every single one of these Arab leaders is dead man walking. Yeah. Okay. Um, how, when they go, I can't tell you. Yeah. But I'll tell you why I say that, and it gets to, what I saw in Tahrir Square, which was something mom so much more than a democracy. Uh, it was about three things, Tahrir Square. The first thing it was about was, and this is, this is over and above everything, it was about dignity. Okay, it was about people who living in a hyper-connected world could see how well China's doing, how well India's doing, and how far behind they had fallen. The number of Egyptians in Tahrir Square who said to me, I was ashamed to show my Egyptian passport. People actually said, imagine being ashamed to show your American passport. So first, it was about dignity. Second, uh, it was about justice. These people live in deeply unjust societies. Um, and that's why the first thing they did was burn down the police stations and burn down the party headquarters. Mm -hmm. And the last thing it was about was freedom. But freedom broadly construed. Um, it wasn't just freedom you know, in the governmental set, but to run my life, to think my thoughts, to collaborate with whoever I want. Now, you take all of those three and you put them together with one more thing. People forget about 800 Egyptian kids, uh, mostly kids, lost their lives um, in th those days when the regime tried to come back, its thugs. Uh, that's, that's 800 more Egyptians than have died in the Egyptian army since 1973. So one of the things that was very striking when you went around the square, because uh, I got there the week after that, uh, a few days after it, is that there were small pictures um, everywhere excuse me, um, of, the, of the people who died. Um, and then there were little, next day there were bigger pictures. Then there were wall-sized pictures of the people who died. And they're all labeled in Arabic, shaheed, martyr. Right. And I thought, wow, I've never seen that before. Oh, I've seen martyrs against Israel. I've seen martyrs against America. But martyrs for democracy, I've right. never seen that before. Now, you take a movement propelled by dignity, justice, and freedom, wrap it in the myth narrative of democracy, and, and then you put it in Egypt. And what happens in Egypt doesn't stay in, in Egypt, Egypt, okay? Um, and then I tell you, you have a movement that is going to, because every walking, living, breathing Arab, I would argue today, in the Arab world, feels every one of those things. Right. And right. so every one of these regimes is dead man walking. I don't know when or, or, or how. Now, to take you back to the book yeah. and to, uh, right. to more domestic, you said, uh, you've said that the decade beginning in September 11, 2011, yeah. was the worst decade in American history. My first reaction was, you know, where were you doing the 1860s? Right, sure. um, I'm, I'm going I'm to stick by that claim. Yeah, and yeah. I'm thinking, okay, 1860s, yeah. amidst all this stuff, Lincoln is doing land-grant right. colleges, he's, he's trying to stuff. do the education yeah. system right, he's trying to build the infrastructure, transcontinental railroad, yes. all during the war, and, you know. The perfect, and we didn't, we didn't pre-rehearse this. God, this thing is not um, sticking here, sorry. Um, so we argue, I said, four great problems, IT globalization, yeah. uh, a deficit in climate. The next chapter is called um, uh, Ignoring Our History, um, because in fact, just what you said, Walter, I would argue we in America, we actually have an, in, we're not supposed to say this, so don't let it out of this room, we actually have an industrial policy in this country, okay? That is, we actually have a formula for success. Um, as much as some of you might think that you did this all by yourself, whatever wealth you built, whatever business you built, whatever NGO you've started, knock it off, okay? <laughs> all right? Um, 
you built this as a result of the greatest public-private partnership in the history of the world. And this public-private partnership is best seen in Lincoln's time, but we argue, Walter, it goes all the way back to Hamilton. That public-private partnership we have in this country is built on five pillars. One is education. We educate our people up to and beyond whatever the level of technology is, starting with universal primary, universal high school, and then post-secondary. Uh, second, it's immigration. We attract the world's first round intellectual draft choices, we bring them to this country, and we make them citizens. Um, third is infrastructure. We build the best infrastructure uh, we can in the world. Uh, fourth are rules for risk-taking and capital formation. That is, we, we have rules both to govern markets, to govern and tame capitalism, and we have rules to incent people, a careful balance. And the last is government-funded research. Those are the five pillars of our success. And they are, um, and, they, and, and as Walter said, look what Lincoln did in the middle of the Civil War. He starts the land-grant universities. He passes the Homestead Act. He creates the Transcontinental Railroad. You see them repeated in every great president up to the last decade. Now, you look at every indice of those. Education, uh, on, on any indice of education, whoop, uh, infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, the American Engineering Society rates our infrastructure as C+. Plus says we have a $2 trillion infrastructure deficit. Whoop. Uh, immigration, I don't have to tell you what's happening with, uh, we basically are educating the world's best talent and sending them home. Whoop. Uh, rules for um, risk-taking capital formation. How did you like that subprime crisis? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and lastly, government-funded research uh, falling off the charts. Why? So, so if you take all five of the things that got us here, um, they're all going off the, uh, going off the rails. Um, why? Um, well, I think, again, it gets back to the politics. It gets back to s situational to sustainable, or s sustainable to situational. It gets back to not talking about the world that we're in. You know, Bob Inglis is a Republican congressman from South Carolina. He has the distinction of being one of two congressmen who were defeated in the last election in a Republican primary. In other words, a Republican ran against right. him because... This conservative South Carolina congressman uh, was not conservative enough. Um, he, can somebody help me with this? Yeah, thing? sorry. Um, uh, You're not very good I at got the it. Madonna. I'm not, not, not good at this thing. Okay. Uh, Bob Inglis is actually, it's because this thing is. Uh, actually, uh, do we have another microphone, yeah, please? Yeah. Uh, I got it, I got yeah. it. It's just hooked on my shirt. Uh, Bob Inglis is the, um, was the object of probably the greatest political quote of the 2010 uh, midterm election. Uh, at a town hall meeting in a small town in South Carolina, a man stood up and basically said, as the exact quote in the book, keep your filthy government hands off my Medicare. Yes, that was a famous one. Okay, um, so, uh, and he tells the whole story in the book. So it gets back to the fact that we have this beautiful public-private partnership. No one wants to talk about it. No one wants to defend it. No one wants to connect it to the world that we're in. And... Um, and that's why what we need to be doing now is we need to do three things. We need to cut, um, we need to raise taxes, um, we need revenue, because we also need to reinvest, reinvigorate our formula for success. And so if we go out now cutting and slashing, and I'm all for cutting, but if you don't do it in the framework of a plan that's built on the arteries of your success, you're actually gonna make the problem so much worse you're going to imperil the American dream. That's what's going on. This is a really dangerous moment right now. We, people don't, we're driving without a bumper and a spare tire. We use the bumper and the spare tire just to get out of the subprime crisis. So, you know, we have to have a really, the smartest possible debate at all and connect it up with our history and how we got Are here. Are you disappointed that Obama hasn't led further on this? I'm disappointed with everybody, you know, and... Um, uh, uh, I'm disappointed with Obama uh, because I voted for Barack Obama. I'm not supposed to say that, so I didn't. You strike that from yeah, the record. Please don't yeah, please let him right. leave this room. We're not supposed Go to say him. that. <laughs> if I had voted for Obama, the reason I voted for him, um, I would have voted for him, is because I yeah. thought he would change the polls, not read the polls. I thought he had the unique ability to change the polls, not just read the polls. And I see a man just reading the polls. Um, uh, and I see the Republicans behaving just, in, in my view, just with utter recklessness. Um, we have two chapters in the book. One is called The War on Physics, and the other is called The War on Math. And throughout the decade of the, thank you, 
of the uh, uh, first decade of the 20th century, we've been at war simultaneously. We declared war on math and physics. Yeah. We said deficits don't matter and climate change is a hoax. Now you can believe whatever you want about climate change, how we should adapt to it, deal with it, whatnot. But it is not a hoax. And when you start there, when someone praises Mitt Romney for his courage in saying that climate change is not a, a, not a hoax, you know, I mean, what, what courage for him to say that the apple actually dropped from the tree on Newton's head, you know, it didn't go from Newton's head up the tree, you know, what a brave man, oh, he gets my vote, you know, that's where we are, do you realize how far you are from reality, you know, so, um, so that's the problem, and that's why the conclusion of our book um, is called Shock Therapy. Um, well, let, so, well let, let me just stop. So at some point, if they go off a cliff on the debt ceiling and everything else, uh, I'm leading into your last chapter, but why don't we form another? I mean, why isn't there yeah. some other alternative? Well, we think there is, Walter. You know, and basically there are two alternatives. You see, if we do the with debt the way we should be doing it, and, and Simpson and Bowles have laid out that plan for us. Yeah. Um, that's like going to the dentist and getting a rotten tooth pulled with Novocaine by a dentist. You know, it comes out, it hurts, but you get it out. If we don't do that, our tooth is coming out. Only the dentist will be called the market and mother nature. Yeah. And when the market and mother nature do your dental work, that's like having a caveman remove your tooth with stone tools. Now the tooth will come out, okay? But there will be blood all over you, all over the floor, okay? And it won't be, he'll probably knock out the other three teeth around it as well, okay? So that's what we're in danger of right now. And that's why the last chapter of the book is called shock therapy. It's a term also, uh, it's a double entendre. It's what we told the Soviet Union they needed at the right, end that. of the Cold War. Um, we are the ones who need shock therapy now. Uh, we believe we need a third party. Um, I am for a third party. If Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles want to run as president and vice president, <laughs> I will vote for them. Um, uh, if uh, if uh, Michael Bloomberg wants to run, um, I'm very happy to vote for him. We need a shock to the system. Now, I have no illusions right now that a third party can win, although I think the, the, the country, in my view, is in a radical mood. I think the country is in a much more radical mood. Are we mood. talking about, like, a few months from now, January, February, 2012, assuming things went bad with the debt ceiling, assuming the administration didn't get unemployment down, and assuming the Republicans nominate somebody that the vast independent right. middle of the country finds acceptable? Do you think in 2012 a Mike Bloomberg or somebody could run? I do. I really do, Walter, and I hope they do, um, because... You know, just imagine Matt Miller, um, who writes for the Washington Post occasionally and works for McKinsey, did a wonderful column about this. You know, how many mornings do you turn on Sunday mornings, meet the press, and there's Mr. Republican or Mrs. Yeah. Democrat and whatnot, and they're debating, and each one's you know, spewing their, their, their party line. Wouldn't you just love if there was somebody in the middle mm -hmm. saying, these two people are talking <laughs> complete nonsense. Or somebody with these two common sense. Yeah, these yeah. two people are talking complete nonsense. This one actually thinks that we can get out of this hole without raising taxes, and this one thinks we can get out of this hole without cutting entitlements. What nonsense! And and then sort of lays out. Wouldn't, wouldn't you just? What would you pay? That would be pay per view for me. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I would. I would love. I would love that. You know, and and that's what's totally missing. Now I don't think a third party can win for a lot of reasons. But what we say, our conclusion in the book is there's just two things we'll tell you about a third party. One is it won't win the next election. And two, if it's led by a Bloomberg, it'll have more impact on the next president than the person who does win. Because let's remember what Ross, Ross Perot won almost 20% of the vote. You know, at one point he had 40% of the polls and he was nuts. He thought little black, <laughs> he, he thought little black helicopters were chasing him. Imagine, imagine that Michael Bloomberg runs. He doesn't need a dime from anybody. He takes as his economic plan Simpson Bowles. He attaches onto it, you know, a, a carbon tax, you know, to raise money for, for government research. Whatever, you know, you could imagine what the agenda is. I tell you, Walter, he'll, he'll, he'll get more than, than Perot's 18.9% of the vote. Um, and I think it would really 
shake up the system, and this system needs shaking up. We are trapped, I think, in a corrupt duopoly, um, and, and basically, you know, I'll tell you this, the one thing about the internet and the hyper-connected world, it has flattened every hierarchy in the world, from the New York Times, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> to uh, banking industry, it's flattened every hierarchy in the world except the two-party system, Correct. and that will not remain. Yeah. I, that is a prediction that I will make. I, I think this is going to be a radical election unless, in my view, and this would be my first choice, unless Barack Obama becomes the third-party candidate. <laughs> you know, it takes us back to Lincoln, who, when the Whigs and the uh, you know, Democrat-Republican <laughs> Party were corrupt back then, uh, you get a movement that right. eventually changes things. Let me open it up, since we've now started running people for president. Yes, sir, and then behind. Uh, microphones will run. I think we only have one microphone. So, uh, uh, okay, right here, we'll, and then who's over here looking for a mic? All right, Leo, write the person nearest you so you can save your energy. Go ahead. Uh, John Debs, Palo Alto. Tom, thanks again for your leader you leadership. Up, John? Um, my question is, if it's 10 men walking in, in uh, the Middle East, uh, there's a country called Saudi Arabia, which you've written a lot about. Uh, I, I, I realize the present head is about dead anyways, but what uh, this country doesn't realize is what happens if, if it goes. Could you comment on that, please? Sure. I mean, uh, the question was about Saudi Arabia and what will happen there. And um, none of us know. You know, the, the king is somewhere. We don't have a birth certificate. And so somewhere in his mid-80s tire, Hey, the crown prince is is uh, extremely ill and incapacitated. Even worse, yeah. Um, and and so the acting crown prince um, is also in his 80s and uh, extremely conservative. Um, they claim they have a plan, you know, for for succession, but um, you know, let's remember the Arab world. 50% um, of the Arab world is under the age of 25, um, and that applies in spades to Saudi Arabia. And um, so what they've done is all these Arab countries that have survived. You know, they've all. Uh, made huge payoffs to the people. The Saudis gave, the Kuwaitis gave everybody $3,000, the Saudis gave everybody, you know, some huge amount of money. They actually can't, you know, we think of them as, uh, they, they, this is gonna become a real budgetary problem along the way. I actually, on my way to Egypt, stopped in the West Bank and saw uh, Salam Fayyad, the Palestinian prime minister, and, and he quipped to me, you know, it'd be a lot cheaper for all of them to let their people vote, you know. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and so, I thought that was a, um, but I, I would say that I, I don't know how it unfolds. I don't know how any of this unfolds, and I hope Egypt unfolds in a positive way. All, all I would tell you this, I think we're at the, we're at the top of the first inning still mm -hmm. uh, with this whole, th this whole thing. It's going to take a long time to play out. I don't know how. Yes, sir. Yeah, you had mentioned the Obama effect in one of your columns before. And, uh, Where is it? Where, can right you stand here. up? I'm sorry, yes, yeah. thanks. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate on how the young... Arab would look, you know, might be... Right. Yeah. Well, one of the things I was speculating about, and, and um, friends in the Arab world somehow, they, they, they resisted this because they thought it took away, and I didn't mean it that way, from, from the people actually went out in the street. But I, I was referring to the fact, I, I was trying to think about um, what, you know, whenever you have a movement as big as something like the Arab Spring that really goes across 300 million people, it has multiple inputs. And so I did a column, and it was really just speculating. What are some of the inputs that you didn't see uh, on the streets? And, and one of them, and again, this was just speculation, was that when Obama spoke in Cairo uh, uh, right after his election, I speculated that there was someone in the audience, um, a young Egyptian, who looked up and said, hmm, his me? middle name's Hussein, <laughs> my name's Hussein. Uh, he's dark-skinned, I'm dark-skinned. His grandfather was a Muslim. My grandfather's a Muslim. He's president of the United States, and I can't vote. That who knows what seed, you know, that planted. Who knows what seed is planted. I did a column about this a few years ago. You know, uh, 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 during Ramadan, there's a, they, people exchange uh, um, these candles, and now they're electronic, you know, basically. Um, it's a tradition. They're called fawanis, and they're lanterns, bas basically. And um, I, I did a, a column a couple of years ago that if you look all across Egypt, now they have these lanterns, actually they have a microchip in them that play Egyptian folk songs. Mm -hmm. And they light up at night. And if you turn it over, it says made in China. <laughs> so you have China making the iconic Ramadan gift in one of the lowest wage 
countries in the world. And I think that's another kind of subtle, so those are the kind of things that I think nourish this rebellion in, that are not obvious, but were behind the scenes. When you saw Salem Fayyad, what did you think about the peace process on the Palestinian Israelis now? Next question out there. Um, you, <laughs> you, uh, you up on Red Mountain. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, the people who need an Arab Spring most right now uh, are Israelis and Palestinians. And, um, uh, you know, I, I really um, am going to do a panel on this later, you know, tomorrow, but, um, you know, I really fear that Bibi Netanyahu is going to be the Husni Mubarak of the peace process. Uh, and what do I mean by that? The time to make big decisions in life and in business, and we have a lot of men and women here in the business community, is when you have all the leverage on your side. That's when you make big decisions. You see farther, you think clear, you're more intelligent. Husni Mubarak had 30 years of leverage on his side to reform Egypt. And what did he do? He actually choked people more and more every day. And then he tried to do in six days what he should have done over 16 years. Mm -hmm. Didn't work and he collapsed. The asymmetry in power today between Israel and all the surrounding Arab states and the Palestinians, Walter, it's never been greater. It has so much leverage on its side. And we have an Israeli prime minister who's behaving as if Israel is, as Abi Ibn once quipped, a disarmed Costa Rica. Okay. Um, and so Israel just goes from, I'm weak, how can I compromise, to I'm strong. Why should I compromise? Now the Palestinians, um, I mean, they've made every mistake in the book, because uh, they were just the flip side of that. You had Olmert, you had an Israeli prime minister who was offering them the Clinton peace initiative. And they, they played games around that. And even let's give Bibi his due. He gave them a nine month freeze. In month nine, the Palestinians showed up. So um, I really think this is on a tragic track. You have zero, I think, meaningful leadership on both sides. And um, uh, they're heading for a train wreck at the UN. And I hope we in America, I, I just hope we get out of the way. I, I think that that's the, uh, we, we just need we to get out of the way. We shouldn't veto it? I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that. I, I don't want to come out yet and say, but I'm, I'm not sure that they don't need some real shock therapy. Yeah, Bloomberg, could, never mind. <laughs> um, uh, yes, sir. And then um, uh, Blue, I'm sorry, got the hand up first. Uh, uh, Bob Cardman, Boston. Uh, hey, Bob. I was thrilled to hear that Simpson and Bowles are your ticket. <laughs> my question is. Is Alan Simpson here? I just saw him. Alan, stand up and make your acceptance speech. Alan, my man, where is Alan? <laughs> <laughs> stand up, Alan, just for a second. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> Let everyone watching on the internet note the applause. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but help me out here, you advocated uh, tax increases, and I thought Simpson-Bowles had a different approach to broadening our tax base but lowering rates. Uh, could you I, think, could, you are you really Simpson? for Simpson-Bowles? I'm going to let Alan answer. Hey, well, why don't we hand the mic over to yeah. Alan, because it is <laughs> yeah. on yeah. the question of revenue increases. I'm happy to cede um, the floor to my friend, the senator. <laughs> <laughs> I have just left the witness protection program. <laughs> <laughs> but I've known Friedman and Walt a long time, and if I had known you dirty, oh shoot. <laughs> uh, what we said, we were stunned. We found one trillion, 100 billion in tax expenditures, which are simply tax spending or tax earmarks. One trillion, 100 billion a year. Untouchable, no oversight know nothing. And they're little, home mortgage interest deductions, oil and gas depletion allowance, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, parking for employees, no, no income tax on savings of insurance. So we said, okay, get rid of them all. Take a hundred billion and reduce the deficit. Take the other trillion and give them three tax rates. Zero to 70 grand, 8%. 70 grand to 210, 14%. Everything over 270, 23%. And lower the corporate tax to 26, from 36 
and go to a territorial support system on distribution of the corporate revenue. There it is. And you can do it. Bravo. Another, uh, yeah, uh, Leslie, Doc, right here. Phenomenon that seems to be ha going on. You just yeah, right. another phenomenon that appears to be going on that you described is that many people in this room and elsewhere here in the United States, in a sense, have given up on government. So people are forming NGOs. They're doing things in business to make social change. And what do you think it takes? Does it take just a candidate people can rally behind? How do individuals participate in this process and make a meaningful change? Uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, if you don't have a solution that's at the scale of the problem, you really don't, you have a hobby. I like hobbies, but <laughs> I used to build model airplanes, but I, I wouldn't, for instance, try to change the climate as a hobby, you know. You really need collective action now. That's the point we're at. God bless every person starting an NGO, a political group, an online forum. Uh, but ultimately, uh, until you can translate it into numbers that can actually reverse the Supreme Court decision on Citizens United, you really can't affect the system, you know. And so that's really, I mean, I, it's got to start somewhere, and I think it's, you know, it, it, it leads into uh, the, the penultimate chapter of this book, which is called, They Just Didn't Get the Word. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I should say that, you know, we kind of have two schools in the country today. Those who are w what I would call um, exceptionalists, we're exceptional, okay? Don't bother me, we're exceptional. If the president doesn't say we're exceptional enough, or if he doesn't put the right emphasis on the first syllable, you know, we're going to crucify him. And we have those of the declinists, okay? Well, I, I'm not an exceptionalist, because I don't think American exceptionalism is an entitlement like Social Security, that we just get to keep saying we're exceptional, okay? But I'm not a declinist. What we say in our book is we are optimists, but we are frustrated optimists. That is my political mo I am a huge optimist about America. The reason I'm an optimist, and it's the penultimate chapter of the book, is that this country is still full of people who just didn't get the word. They didn't get the memo. They didn't get the memo that we're down and out. They didn't get the memo that we're in a decline. And so they go out and they start stuff and they invent stuff and they create stuff and they build collaboration and it's what truly saves us, okay? One of my favorite quotes in, in journalism is I interviewed one of the Marines who was involved in the surge in Iraq in Anbar province. I said, why did you guys do that? He said, Tom, we were just too dumb to quit. Mm -hmm. okay? And this country, blessedly, is full of people too dumb to quit. But if we do not enable those and empower those people by rebuilding the five pillars of our formula for success, we will never get this rocket ship and the American dream back to where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. um, and because, i just say one thing, because I don't know when we have to close, but... In a few more minutes. Um, well then th th that I'll just end that there, but I, I would did want to take one thing on education, if we can get to that. Sure, we will. We have actually great. have about great. 10, 15. Oh, good, I, went, I went to questions earlier. I'm sorry, the gentleman in yellow, I ignored now this time, and then I'll have... Uh, we're not there. Hi, Fred Stein from New York. Uh, I'm just going to ask a question on the Arab Spring. With 27% unemployment, or whatever the number is, and no basic industry or structure or anything else, and the only organized parties being the Islamicists, don't you see some real dangers there? Um, you know, it's a really good question, and, and, and the answer is, is, is absolutely yes. Um, the way I think about the Arab Spring is, is like this. Um, My friend Bob Schieffer, who a uh, great CBS newsman, veteran newsman, uh, he gave me my best lesson in journalism. I don't always practice it, um, but it is the best lesson I ever got. Uh, it's all the stories I miss were because I was talking when I should have been listening. <laughs> it's a great journalism lesson. And I did practice that when I was in Cairo, that every day I walked to Tahrir Square, I just said, you know what? You are seeing elephants fly. You are seeing something you never thought you would see before, nobody predicted, and yet it's unfolding before your eyes. Shut up, take notes, keep listening. And so I can give you a million reasons why this will fail. Uh, I could make a list, really a long list, and you highlighted some very accurate ones. And it's the thing that worries me most. I happen to come, I happen to be in Singapore when this started, looking at the Singapore school system. 
And uh, then I went to Davos, and when I was in Davos, um, everything erupted in Egypt, and my wife, God bless her, I was on book leave, called me and she said, honey, they're playing your song, <laughs> okay? Because um, I've been about the Arab democracy thing, that's since the start of the Iraq war, that's what it's always been about for me. And so the Times wanted me to go back, and she said, you have my permission not to come home, not to PESCO, not to collect $300. <laughs> so I, I, I went out there. And um, I will tell you, it's the most remarkable story I ever covered because it is such a human story. And what it tells you is human beings are capable of surprising you in so many ways. But here's what worries me, and this gets to the validity of your question. When you go from Singapore, where the government on any given day can be asking itself, how do we better teach fractions to third graders? Like the whole government there, mm -hmm. I exaggerate, but you know what I mean, can be thinking about that. And you realize in Egypt that thought never crossed Hosni Mubarak's mind in 30 years. You realize how much ground they have to catch up. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, just keep Judith, talking, you'll Judith catch up Barnard, with you. Barnard, I live in Aspen, uh, occasionally Chicago. You began your talk with the uh, Maryland um, escalators saying people are saying we got used to it. So why do you then say that the American public are becoming radical when it seems to us that too much of the American public is quite getting used to it? Uh, it's a legitimate question. I'm sure some people are getting used to it, but my experience um, in the last year is how many people are so anxious for someone. People will get used to it if they feel they have no choice. You know? But if they start to perceive there is another choice, I think you'd see that flip in a second. Who has a question about K through 12 education? Since Tom said that was the one thing he uh, still wanted to get to. Oh, come on. I advise at the Arnie Duncan session. Uh, <laughs> That's right. We got all the education people over there. Well, let me just. Leah, go ahead. I just make the point because um, so much of the book is devoted to education, and I wouldn't want it to go without it, um, without talking a little bit about um, uh, the point we're, 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 uh, we're trying to make which is that um, what's happening uh, in this kind of hyper-connected world now is, uh, as I said, what uh, labor economists call in the jargon skills bias polarization, which is that if you have skills, you know, you can do computing, um, you're more valuable than ever, and if you don't, uh, there's virtually nothing for you anymore. Um, and so uh, the, the days in which uh, the um, 50,000 uh, person steel mill could come to your town, uh, and absorb all the people in the middle uh, are really gone. And um, so we've kind of four chapters on this. First, I say it's called Up in the Air, which is just about the phenomena. Um, uh, the second is called Homework Times Two Equals the American Dream. And that is that if we want to pass on the American Dream to our kids, um, it's going to take homework times two. Because the days in which we had all the advantages we had coming out of World War II are over. And so we have two education challenges in this country. We actually have to lift the bottom to the average. Um, and that's a huge problem that so many people are working on and discussing here. But we also have to lift the average so much higher. We have so many kids being educated, they don't know it for $12 an hour jobs, not $40 an hour jobs. And that leads to the, um, the, the next chapter, which is called Help Wanted. Because again, it, it, we try to, Whatever I do um, in, in, in my work, I try to operate inductively because I'm not an educator, I don't know. So what we did is actually interview employers today. Um, we actually interviewed employers and said, what kind of employees are you looking for? And then work backwards from that to what kind of education, mm -hmm. therefore, do you need? And so we interviewed four sort of types of employers. One high-end white collar, uh, the head of a Washington law firm. One low-end white collar, the guy who ran the, actually the outsourcing firm uh, where I wrote The World is Flat. Um, third, a blue collar, Alan Coleman, the chairman of DuPont. And fourth, um, uh, the head of the, uh, the biggest green collar employer in America, uh, Major General Martin Dempsey, uh, the head of the U.S. Army education team, um, now promoted to chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And um, I just leave you with this thought, you know, which is what all four of them said it was striking how much they had in common, Walter. Um, and uh, what they all said was that we need workers who can do critical thinking and problem solving. Mm -hmm. Not just read, write, and arithmetic, but critical thinking and problem solving to get an interview. 
Okay, so this thing, people, as you see, the flatter the world gets, and that gets to the last chapter, which is called Average is Over. Mm -hmm. Average is officially over. So whatever you do, you better find your extra. Because what's happened is the whole global curve, the more the world gets hyperconnected, has just moved up. My mother-in-law was chairman of the board of Grinnell College, mm -hmm. wonderful liberal arts college in the middle of Iowa. Some of you may have seen our story in the New York Times. Last year, one out of 10 applications to Grinnell were from China. Mm -hmm. Of those um, 250 applications, half had 800 on their math SAT. Okay. So the whole global curve is moving up. And what you find now from employers, and this was the most interesting thing, and I'll just give this example. So the head of the Washington law firm, who happens to be a, a, a personal friend, his name is Jeff Lesk, and I said to Jeff, um, so actually this all started during the subprime crisis. Mm -hmm. I said, Jeff, um, subprime crisis hit. I said, what's happened to your law firm? He said, oh, we're laying people off. Um, and I said, that's interesting. Who gets laid off first? He's kind of curious. He says, it's not who you think. It's not last in, first out. The people who are being laid off are when the credit bubble was at its height and we had all that work. We handed it to those lawyers. They did that work in a very nice way and they handed it back. Those are the ones who are gone. The ones who are staying are those who can say, you know, Jeff, we could do this old work in a new way. Or actually, there's a whole new set of work we can do. Mm -hmm. So his section actually in the book starts with him explaining my law firm just hired a chief innovation officer. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so basically what's happening now is people don't want just critical thinking and problem solving. They want people who can invent, reinvent any job they're doing. And that is going to be the new, new thing, I think, in the labor market, and that's got to feed back into education. Yep. You and I, Walter, had the privilege, I'll just end here, when we got out of college, we got to find a job. Mm -hmm. I think our kids are going to have to invent a job. <laughs> Now, your wife is a teacher, right? Uh, your daughter, Orly, was in Teach for America and then remained a teacher, stayed on. Um, how do we, uh, it, it takes new types of teachers, it would seem, if uh, we're going to reform the education system. Or how would you reform the education well, system? Well, you know, we, we get in this homework times two chapter. Um, uh, the way it begins is that um, we would never give uh, Hillary Clinton advice, um, but uh, career advice. But had she come to us and asked that the president wants me to be Secretary of State, um, we would have said, no, um, uh, Ms. Clinton, you want the top national security job. You want to be Secretary of Education. Is okay. Arnie, Arnie's wandering um, around. Uh, that, uh, uh, no. So no, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that, to me, I think Arnie Duncan um, has, is, has the top national security job in the country. Um, we've had the pleasure, Walter, because you've had so many great education panels here yeah. to hear so much about you know, technology and new ideas. And what we say in the book is that uh, we really don't know what is sufficient. Uh, more charters or less charters. Bigger classrooms or smaller classrooms. Yeah. More technology or less technology. We leave that to the amazing experts that, that you've okay. assembled here. There is something we feel we might know, and that is what is necessary. And that's collective action. That... Um, Yes, you know, every, you know, we, we, we always want better educated, you know, better enabled teachers. We're all for that. But, but knock it off, all right, with the teachers, all right? We need better parents who prepare their kids to go to school and understand the priority of education. We need students who are ready to come to school, ready to learn, not to text, because they know what world they're living in. We need politicians who want to raise the educational standards every year because they know what world we're living in. We need neighbors who are ready to invest in their schools even if their kids aren't in them, because they understand if they don't invest in that, they will be investing maybe in prisons down the road, okay? This is a collective task. It takes a village, mm -hmm. okay? You give me better parents, better politicians, better neighbors, and better students, I promise you, the weak teachers will become better, and the best teachers will be awesome. Yeah. Gentleman there with a the yellow and black shirt, yes. You've uh, developed a lot of energy around K to 12 and your four chapter strategy. Have you looked at birth to fi age five where 80% of the brain development occurs and for very much less money and high leverage, if you can increase the percentage of kids that arrive at kindergarten at grade level reading, the expense you would have to put into your four chapters would be yes. brought down to yeah. 20%. All, all for it, you're absolutely right, and um, uh, 
you know, certainly not anything we're against. That's pretty well documented out there, so we're, we're focused on another area, but thank you for raising that. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt back there. Sorry. Uh, oh, hey, it's up. <laughs> I, I would have introduced you. Yeah. Hello, I'm Dave Fuente, hey. and I'm chairman of G100, and we recently put a conference on, and a statement was made that 80% of the young American workforce is unqualified for the armed forces because of academics, criminal record, drugs, or obesity. Um, if, if this is true, well, if we haven't verified this yet, but if this is true, how do we reclaim these people who are out of the educational system already? Uh, well, the, the actual statistic is 75%, not 80%, so we're, we're really heading in the right direction. <laughs> um, and um, uh, and uh, uh, it's from a private study that was done, so I, I, I can't verify it personally, but Arne Duncan did quote that statistic in a speech, actually, because it was one of the things that shocked him, that 75% of the applicants uh, to the U.S. Army uh, can't get in, um, uh, and that's because they couldn't do simple math basically, um, uh, uh, as simple as, um, you know, two plus X equals four. So we actually have a segment in the book out of that study, which is called two plus X equals four. Mm. So um, it's a terrible problem, but it's part of a broader, you know, educational uh, de deficit we have right now. And, um, uh, and as the world gets more and more hyper-connected, what basically that means is that, that's why I, we argue average is over, that everyone has to justify their value add. Because I, as an employer, um, now have access every day a little more to more above average talent anywhere in the world or above average software or above average robotics. So if you can't find your extra to justify that, um, you're, you're going to have a real problem. So that's to me where the discussion should be starting right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's going to be at the core of, of national security. It affects, as you said, the Army. It's going to affect our, our ability to, to produce. And um, we're just, not, see, we filled that gap. We got through the terrible twos the first decade. We filled that gap with credit. We created a whole bunch of jobs in construction, retail, and leisure to soak up all the people who weren't developing those skills. Now we've taken the steroids away, and we're at you know, 9%, and, that, and that's going to be stubbornly there, I think, for, for a while. Yep. Uh, Arnie Duncan will be speaking this afternoon, for those who haven't looked at the schedule, late this afternoon at 10. He also spoke early this morning in the green. Thank you. Steve Shapiro from New York. Thank you very much for your comments. Given the importance of what you have to say, the fabulous cogency with which you say it, the belief that you have and the evidence backing it that everything has flattened, and I think the room would agree that the uh, timing of your remarks should be, or of your, of your analysis and comments about our society should be brought to the public's attention faster rather than slower. I'm curious why you didn't self-publish um, and get this out right away. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know, um, I, I mean, I, I know what self-publishing is, but you know, it'll be out in eight weeks. You know, there's, there's a real virtue, um, frankly, of uh, yeah. you know, going through the editing process and um, careful deliberation, and, and uh, for an eight-week delay, you know, that, that's, that's kind of worth, worth it for me, but um, it'll be out there soon enough, but I appreciate the sentiment. Thank you very much. Now, but on that point, yeah. we'll end here, uh, because of this new media landscape. Yeah. At one extreme, you have tweeting, where you can get something out real fast, instantly. And at the other, we still have the notion of the book. Right. The idea that I'm going to spend a lot of time and think about it. There's going to be some attitudes yeah. and some eyes or whatever. Uh, you began this week by saying you'd never use Twitter and never use Facebook uh, at one of our discussions yeah. on this stage. And then I saw you over at Meadows with the founders of Twitter, and they were pu putting their, you know, Ev and Biz were sort of poking back at you. Uh, do you see your mix of media changing? Do you see yourself wanting to be more engaged in social media? Do you think books will always be the stable uh, form that you yeah. use? You know, it's a good question, uh, Walter. Uh, 
it, it's all about um, kind of how you work, basically. And um, first of all, I like to get all my news tartar as much as I can. So I like to be in Tahrir Square. I don't want to have it filtered through. So I'm going to see, I'm going to look at posters on the wall and say Martyrs for Democracy that someone else might not see. So I want to be there, number one. So it's all about really time management. And um, uh, my wife is the smartest person I know. She's also never been on Twitter, and, and she just got a Facebook page because she's always busy reading books and reading the paper, usually for me also, you know, <laughs> to um, saying, did you see this, things I missed. So it's all just about I, I can't concentrate when people are pinging me all the time and, um, or stopping and saying, did you see what was written about you? I mean, if I stopped for that, you know, every time someone write something critical, praiseworthy, challenging. You just, you cannot focus. I don't think you can think straight. And so I've just put as much of this technology, you know, out of my uh, hands as I can and survive uh, because um, I'm just overwhelmed by it. So, God, every morning I get up, I read, this morning I read Haaretz, Beirut Daily Star, you know, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post. That's great. I love all that. But you also got to know when to stop when to go out and report yourself um, and not get distracted because, you know, people, you know, just to wrap up several points here, you know, people will say to me, it's re really easy for you to say that uh, average is over. You, you know, you, you have a column in the New York Times, you know. Oh, you don't understand. I inherited James Reston's office. Mm -hmm. Wow, what an honor, mm -hmm. you know. He's a great editor and columnist in the 60s and 70s. And I suspect I wouldn't be insulting Mr. Reston if I said he woke up many days and said, I wonder what my seven competitors are going to write today. Mm -hmm. I wonder what Walter Lippmann's going to write. I wonder what Alsop's going to write. I wonder what Mary McGrory's going to write. I wake up every day and say, I wonder what my 70 million competitors are going to write today. <laughs> okay? um, and if I can't offer some value add, you know, on the best blogger out of Iraq or the best blogger out of Israel or the best blogger, you know, on it, you know if I can't add value. Now, I'm, that's what people, I'm running, Walter, as fast as I've ever run. And to do that, okay, you want to take in as much as you can, but if you are overwhelmed by it, you know, one of the things, I'm never, in, I'm not involved in internet wars. If you say something nasty about me, there's one thing I can guarantee you, I won't fire back, you know, because I'm just too busy trying to figure it out, you know what I mean? And uh, I see a lot of people, in, in my mind, wasting a lot of time and energy um, uh, uh, that these technologies can take you down into blind alleys. So that's why I do what I do. So we look forward to the book, well, A Great Form of Media <laughs> thank and thank Communication. Thanks so much. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bravo. Bravo. The preceding program has been made possible in part through our partnership with U.S. Trust. From wealth structuring to investment management, U.S. Trust's global perspective, unique team approach, fiduciary platform, and more than 200 years of experience provide for the kind of insights, solutions, and expertise that have a worth all their own.